Hey guys, before we get started on the video, I have a fun little announcement. Culture Crash now has a PO box. You guys can send in fan mail, fan art, really anything you want, and hopefully at some point down the line we'll be able to integrate it into a fan mail opening video. The details will be down below the video, but they'll also be on our social media pages, so if you follow us on Twitter or Facebook, you can see it there. Just for posterity, I'll give it to you guys one time right here at the start of this video. The address is PO Box 149, Park Orchards 3114, Victoria, Australia. We can't wait to see what you guys have dreamt up to send us, but for now, let's jump into the video. Why do humans take risks? Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to talk about risk taking. More specifically, what drives people to take risks and how we can make better decisions. Oh cool, so you're essentially going to tell us how to live our lives. What is this, one of your pathetic rant videos? <laughs> Please, you're just complaining because you never get to be in any of them. I have feelings too, Culture! Deep feelings! You don't think I want to vent about them sometimes? What gives you the right to unload all of your problems on us? Whoa, calm down, buddy. Where's all of this coming from? I... I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Risk taking is defined as... Rouge was her name. Enticing men was her game. It started innocently enough in the summer of 98 when I decided to get away from it all and headed out to the one city who accepted any and all comers. Las Vegas. Right, so clearly you're making up another story because you're like three years old in 1998. So anyway, like I was saying, risk taking is defined as an engagement in behaviours that are associated with some probability of undesirable results. Of course, every action could have an undesirable result, but specifically, we're referring to activities that have a well-understood and inherent risk. To understand risks better, psychologists often break them up into five risk domains. Health risk, such as drinking or smoking. Recreational risk, such as bungee jumping or skydiving. Ethical risk, such as cheating on a partner or breaking the law. Social risk, such as expressing an opinion in a group or making a joke. And financial risk, such as investing in stocks or gambling. Which brings me back to my story. Las Vegas, a jewel that shined brilliantly in the middle of the desert. But the gleaming allure lacked the natural beauty of a true gem. It was instead an artificial glow emanating from the neon lights and illuminated water features. I would soon come to realize the same was true of my bittersweet rouge. I really could not care less. In 2002, Alc Weber, a psychologist from Columbia University with an awesome first name, published a study proposing a new scale to measure how likely people were to take risks among these specific categories, termed domain-specific risk propensity. Weber demonstrated that people's likelihood of taking a risk differed greatly between domains. That is to say, just because someone loves skydiving or rock climbing, this has no link to how likely they are to put themselves forward to speak at a conference. I entered the nearest casino, bound to drown out my sorrows with the noise of the crowd. But what I saw next took my breath away. Rouge. Many people had tried and failed with her. I could tell. But I was special. And immediately she felt special to me. I had to go to her. So you might say you took a social risk by approaching her. Wow, I even surprised myself with how much of a stretch that was to connect your asinine story to risk taking. But it is worth noting that certain traits have predispositions to taking risk. For example, people in relationships tend to be more risk averse. Guys tend to be more financially or recreationally risky, whereas girls tend to be more socially risky. So-called adrenaline junkies are theorized to engage heavily in risk because of neurobiological differences in their dopamine receptor pathways. Dopamine is, put simply, the neurotransmitter responsible for the feeling of joy in the reward pathway of our brain. This sensation is tightly controlled, however, in part by inhibitory receptors that, when stimulated, shut off dopamine signaling. David Zold, a professor of psychology at Vanderbilt University, demonstrated that adrenaline junkies have less of these inhibitory receptors and therefore experience a bigger thrill from recreational risks than most people. This craving or addiction overrides their risk aversion, leading them to do extremely dangerous sports that we get to watch on YouTube in the safety of our home. Easily one of the most important determinants for risk aversion is age, where older people tend to be more risk averse than younger people. The important exception to this rule is, of course, teenagers. She looked young, new to the scene, but there was an unmistakable worldliness to her. Maybe she had traveled, but more likely she had learned the ways of the world from the many clients she entertained. That didn't bother me, though. It only added to her charm. Adolescence is usually seen as a time for rebellion, 
breaking of rules to explore the world around us. Of course, this desire is usually manifested in activities that put ourselves at risk in every conceivable way. Most notable is experimentation with alcohol, where the CDC reported in 2015 that in the US approximately 10% of 14 year olds and 35% of 18 year olds had drunk in the 30 days preceding the survey. Keep in mind that in the US the legal drinking age is 21, not 18 like in Australia or the UK. Psychologist Richard Jesser, along with colleagues, developed problem behaviour theory as a psychosocial framework to explain why teenagers engage in these risk-taking or problem behaviours. The theory essentially goes that social structural variables interact to spawn two systems, a personality system and a perceived environment system. And if that sentence made no sense to you, then don't worry because I didn't get it either. Social structural variables are things like your parents' educations and occupations, your awareness of media, social or otherwise, and your friend network. So really, the theory is just saying that your personality and the way you perceive the world are derived from the influences of key people in your life and their own belief systems. In turn, your personality and environmental perception become the determining factors in the chance and extent to which you engage in risk-taking behaviours. These behaviours break out from the rules imposed by others and seek to establish a kind of independence. In fact, the more rigid your social structures, the more drastic your rebellion from these rules are likely to be. I approached, possessed by a boldness I hadn't known before. I sat next to her and the connection was immediate. Rouge was boisterous, unpredictable and alluring. I found my eyes pouring over her contours, but there was no shame in it. Just attraction. A lust. Even there on the crowded casino floor, I felt alone with her. Problem behavior theory is quite good at explaining some aspects of risk taking in adolescence, but it fails to look at the rationalization behind why teenagers make these decisions. That is to say, what is the thinking behind these actions? A widely accepted perception is that the adolescent brain is simply less developed than the adult brain, and therefore makes flawed decisions. This could be true, after all we know that adults have better memory, processing, problem solving and self-evaluation capabilities. A plethora of public policies exist solely to reduce the negative consequences of teenage rebellion, such as underage drinking and smoking laws, age barriers on driving licenses and medical procedures, etc. But are such dramatic measures necessary? Agnieszka Tamula and Leo Rosenberg Bellmaker carried out a study to determine the underlying cause of experimentation in teenagers. Although humans tend to prefer known to unknown risks, this study explored the possibility that adolescents either prefer or are indifferent to ambiguity. Respondents were given a series of lottery options and asked to choose the lottery or a guaranteed $5. One half of the lottery choices had known chances of winning an amount of money greater than $5, enabling respondents to make an informed decision and measuring their baseline risk aversion tendency. The other half of the lottery choices had an ambiguous chance of winning the lottery, where the level of ambiguity was varied. For example, respondents may know that there's at least a 25% chance of winning and a 25% chance of losing the lottery, but the remaining 50% chance is unknown. Check out the full experimental design in their paper because it's pretty genius and well controlled. The details will be in the description. The important part of this is that Taimula and Bellmaker found that teenagers were actually slightly more averse to risk than adults, but they were more likely to engage in ambiguous lotteries. The findings suggest that it's not that teenagers can't process risk or don't care, but rather that they prefer situations in which the risk is ambiguous. Therefore, educational programs about the dangers of drinking or dangerous driving have a real chance at making the risk of these activities clear to teenagers. Just like Rouge. Ambiguous. Mysterious. I wanted to know more. I had to know more. But she hid herself behind a flashy facade. A beautiful appearance that hid a deeper knowledge and machination within. The time I spent with her was so long, but it felt so short. And as the night wound to a close, I grew tired. I wanted to retire to my room, but not to sleep. And without even saying a thing, I could tell she knew how I felt. Okay, Crash, that's enough. This is a thought experiment video. You're not about to- I brought her up to my room and made sweet love to her. Despite being tired from carrying her up all those stairs, our passion filled the air and for a moment I swore I glimpsed her soul. Her true self! Ugh. Let's talk about decision making. Any risks we take are the product of a decision made either consciously or subconsciously. Rational decision making follows seven steps. 
identify the decision, gather information, identify alternatives, weigh the evidence, choose among alternatives, take action, and review your decision. As an example, I clearly skipped step 2 and I chose Crash as my co-host, and I'm currently in step 7, regretting my decision. But for the purposes of risk-taking, we want to focus on step 4, weighing the evidence. Conventionally, we tend to weigh the benefits against the cost to determine what path of action to take. Take this scenario for example. There's a disease affecting 12,000 people every year, and researchers have invented two vaccines. Studies show that the first vaccine consistently saves one quarter of test subjects. The second vaccine has a 1 in 4 chance of saving all 12,000 people, and a 3 in 4 chance that no one will be saved. The researchers only have enough funding to mass produce one vaccine. So which one do you think they should make? We'll give you some time to think about it. I awoke the next morning. God damn it. To a rough shaking. Two bouncers had picked me up and were dragging me by my elbows out of the hotel room door. Rouge was nowhere to be found and I panicked, kicked and screamed, Where is she, you bastards? What have you done with her? The slimmer of the two bouncers responded with a harsh tone. You sicken me. I struggled in their hold all the way till they threw me out on the front steps of the casino. Don't bother coming back, the fat one said. The pavement hurt. Hurt my butt. But my heart hurt more than my butt. Why had I been kicked out? What happened to Rouge? I knew I had to get back into that casino and find out. Jeez, I didn't realize this story was going to turn into some sort of saga. Look, you've wasted enough time as it is with your story. How about we pick this up in another episode? Follow Culture Crush on social media!